I would like to bring this meeting of the school committee to order and ask you all to join with me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, it's fairly obvious, but several of our members are not feeling well this evening. But we do have a quorum, and Miss Haywood is coming down at the same time. <laughs> the five of us that are going to be here right here. The first item on our, our agenda is to uh, have an executive session for the purposes of discussing matters relative to collective bargaining issues. Do I have a motion? I'd like to make a motion to move into the executive session for collective bargaining issues. Is there a second to that motion? Ms. Burgess is the second. Uh, any questions on that motion? Now, let me understand this. Is this a roll call vote, or is this a uh, – we did roll call last time, and you told me you wanted it both ways? Uh, it's a roll call. Um, I, I wanted you to do it the other way so it could automatically be logged. Okay. But but let's do roll call. Yeah, fine. And Ms. Grimes. Oh, I see. Roll so call? You, okay. Oh, so it can go up yeah. and logged. Okay, thank you. Right. I kind of understand it, so I'm – Okay. It's all right. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, Ms. Hayward, your vote to executive session? Uh, yes. Yes. Ms. Badger? Yes. Ms. Yes. Do you have a vote? Yes. Ms. Burgess? Yeah. Uh, the school committee will be going to executive sessions for the purposes stated. At the end of executive session, we'll come back out into open session and continue our business for this evening. Thank you very much. Okay, I'd like to bring us back into session. Uh, we started early tonight to have an executive session. We ran a little bit over. I'm sorry to keep you all waiting, but now we're back out in open session to finish our business for this evening. And the first item on our agenda, we have already uh, had our pledge. Uh, Community members, is there anybody attending tonight's meeting who isn't already on the agenda who would like to speak to the committee? And I'm not seeing any hands, so I'm going to move off that agenda item and move on to uh, our representatives. Uh, Plymouth North, we'll start with. Good evening, Ed. Thank you. Starting on February 1st, place your order for that special someone. For a small cost of $2, you can pick up a variety of beautiful valentines made by our very own AP art students. The valentines will be sold at lunches and proceeds will go towards a spring scholarship for graduating seniors in the visual arts program. Come join us today um, for, oh, this already happened, but today um, the, um, <laughs> the um, VPA had a um, Zumba night fundraiser that was $20 to participate um, and the money was going towards their UK trip for April. I assume they had a fun time. Um, DECA students um, are continuing to sell their Hilliard's chocolates, um, chocolate bars for $1 each to offset the cost of DECA states. Caps and gown sales will be starting on February 1st, 2019. Caps and gowns are required for participation in the ceremony. The cost will be $25 for each person. Model U United Nations students will prepare for their next trip coming up in early March to New York City. They have, they have recently returned from a very successful trip to Model UN Boston um, on January 24th to the 27th. Biomed students will be heading over to BID, BID for the day on February 7th from 9 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. Please join us on February 7th for our AP Parent slash Student Information Night available to families from North and South the event will be held in the cafeteria from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Students at Plymouth North will be heading to Iceland on February 14th through February 24th. Help out sen the senior class by coming to, their Mo's, to the Moe's fundraiser on February 13th. The fundraising will begins at 3 p.m. until 8 p.m. Moe's will be donating 20% of their proceeds to the class of 2019. Funds will help pay for senior events. We encourage all families to follow us on Twitter and Facebook and to utilize our website to find out what is happening at Plymouth North. All right, thank you very much. Thank I, you. I can't believe you're talking about caps and gowns already. I know, it's crazy. <laughs> okay, Plymouth South, Abigail. Congratulations to our National H History Day competitors. First and second place groups have been invited to advance to the South Star History Day competition on March 2nd, 2019. Thank you to all the staff and judges that were involved. It was a great experience for our students. PSHS coach Mike McCosh will coach, will coach the Shriners boys hockey game. He'll be joined by PSHS assistants White and Hall. 
The Shriners Hockey Classic is a high school all-star hockey game sponsored by the Aleppo Shriners and Massachusetts High School Hockey Coaches Association. The game features the best high school senior boys across Massachusetts. Congratulations, Coach McCosh. Well deserved. We are extremely impressed with our Plymouth North and South Poetry Out Loud competitions this week. Poetry Out Loud is a nationwide program that encourages the study of great poetry through challenging recitation competitions. By participating in the program, our high school students strengthen their public speaking skills and self-confidence, all while learning um, about literary history. Congratulations to our first place winner, Elizabeth Carlin. This winter, the Butterfly Project was created by PSHS's art and community students. Art students designed the project to engage the community in, a, in reflecting upon the beauty of each person's unique qualities and story. The Butterfly Project resides at Plymouth South High School, but may also be spotted out in the community. If you come upon the butterfly, take a selfie and share it at the hashtag, this is me, hashtag Plymouth South Butterfly Project. Um, on Thursday, February 7th, all sophomore students and SAD members will be, will be um, attending a presentation in the PAC regarding addiction and teen brain presented by Gosnold. Gosnold is a nationally accredited nonprofit leader in the prevention and treatment and recovery of mental health and substance use disorders and works closely with Plymouth Public Schools. Save the date. Join us for our annual Credit for Life Fair on April 2nd. This year we'll be hosting juniors at the Memorial Hall for this event. This Friday, February 8th, Plymouth South um, High School will celebrate the American Heart Association's 16th annual National Wear Red Day. Stop by the main office this Friday to enjoy a healthy snack and learn more about the heart disease. Our school nurses will have information available. Save the date. The White Ribbon Campaign returns to PSHS on February 11th. The White Ribbon Campaign is a global movement of men and boys working to end male violence against women and girls. The, P the PSHS Theater Guild will present Irid Iridice uh, on February 14th at 7 p.m. in the Performing Arts Center. A mission is free. With the com contemporary characters and ingenious plot twists, the play is a fresh look at a timeless love story. The annual Freshman Academy Strategies for Success Breakfast will take place February 15th at 7.30 a.m. Students who have, that, have been that have been identified as struggling academically in the first semester have been invited. Their parents will have an opportunity to meet Freshman Academy teachers and hear about strategies that can be used to help them succeed. This has proven to be a positive event for these students to gain back on track. Finally, congratulations to the South Wrestling team as they have won their eighth straight league title. Special recognition to our senior captains, Mike Collins and Matt Harrington, for their leadership with this group. Congratulations to Coach LaRanger and his staff. All right, thank you very much. Excellent mm -hmm. report. Yes, Ed. And um, I, I didn't have this previously written down, but she just reminded me. Um, at Plymouth North, um, we also participated in Poetry Out Loud. And from what I was aware of, it was like the biggest turnout they've ever had. Like th They've done it for the past three years, and most years, um, they're, they're really trying to get kids to do it. They're like, oh, come on, come do it. <laughs> but this year, it was a requirement that, at least in their English classes, all English classes did poetry out loud in the classroom. And like so many kids wanted to go do the school competition. Like They had to have like semifinals during K-Block just to send kids to um, the competition. And I, I just thought that was that's exciting. That, that was really Very cool because it was just kids getting excited oh. about poetry and literature, which doesn't really happen and <laughs> <laughs> too, too often. Which it was a nice twist. Um, and th our first place winner was Oliver Trask. Uh, nice. Excellent. No, I just wanted to. So um, I loved poetry when I was in high school, <laughs> uh, and and even as an adult, I mean, it was the thing to do. You go to poetry slams, and if you yeah. go to, I mean, that is, it was cool. It's still cool to me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I I'm, I was excited to see the um, poetry aloud. I actually was um, a poet laureate for my state when I graduated oh, high school. Oh, awesome! Yeah. Thank Excellent. you. Thank you very much, both of you. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a, our first program update this evening, Dr. Maestas. Yes, this evening we have our food service program. We have uh, Patrick Van Cott and Patty, Patty Callahan. They're here to provide a report regarding food service, and they've been very busy. Uh, we serve a lot of food, and uh, they're excited to bring updates to you um, again this year. So welcome. Good evening, everyone. 
Forgive me if I seem a little flat today. There were a lot of touchdowns scored last night. (laughs) Screaming about. (laughs) What game did you watch? (laughs) A replay of a couple years ago, I think. (laughs) All right. Uh, Food service update. Um, It's funny. We start preparing this uh, within a week (coughs) of last year's uh, because things are just constantly evolving and changing. Um, and it's, it's tough to keep up with Washington at this point uh, on the regulations and everything else that's happening. So we'll start off with um, we have 15 schools slash sites. Uh, it's including um, the Pim- Plymouth Public Schools, Rising Tide, and Council on Aging. Uh, we're feeding 8,037 plus students breakfast and lunch. Free and reduced lunch right now is at 33.09%. Uh, We serve uh, 783,000 lunches and 187,000 breakfasts per year, so we're creeping back up on the million mark, which is our our goal all the time. Uh, We have 70 total employees, one secretary bookkeeper, two van drivers, four managers, eight team leaders, 53 cafeteria workers, and myself and Patty. Uh, And I wanted to uh, say thank you very much for all the hard work that the ladies do. They come up with Uh, different creative menus and they put a lot of uh, strain and work on themselves when they do so to stray off it's it's easy to throw nuggets on a tray but that to make something fresh and and vibrant and uh, grassroots uh, it it, it takes a lot more effort um, and that's the the direction we're going so every day is a different challenge for them Our additional food service programs, uh, our summer food service uh, was an all-time high this past year. Um, we served lunch at four different sites uh, to a total of 25,121 meals. So we never really shut down. As a matter of fact, we have to kind of move our, uh, where we prepare the foods so that they're able to clean and during the, during the summer cleaning uh, at PCIS here, our central kitchen. Um, We have Camp Clark, and the the reason why the the count was so high, we did breakfast and lunch there this year, and it was amazing to see how many kids uh, would come in there, jump off the bus, and eat breakfast as well as lunch. Uh, Boys and Girls Club, same thing. Uh, Here at PCIS, uh, the Title I programs, the reading programs, and at Hedge School, which is an open site, anyone could go there to eat. Uh, We still do the Council on Aging five days a week, year-round. we have uh, Harbor Academy, Pilgrim Academy, Memorial Hall, catering to, for various events, uh, PEC, and Rising Tide Public School. Mm. Our lunch choices, we've had to get a little bit more focused, uh, and I'll talk about that at the end of this, uh, with our elementary schools. We have a hot meal, assorted sandwich, and soups. Secondary schools, we have uh, the Bistro, which serves salads, sandwiches, pre-made or to go, because they have such little time for uh, to eat. So the grab and goes are very popular. The World's Fair is the hot, hot meal, which is the uh, what you read in the newspaper, and the grill: burgers, chicken sandwiches, and hot dogs. We also have contracts with Papa Gino's, Uno's Pizza. Um, we did the uh, tomato sauce project once again. Um, and we were published in the South Shore Living Magazine, September 18th. It's always good to see our Plymouth schools in print uh, for the Garden to School Initiative. Uh, this year, I participated in uh, DOD. Believe it or not, the Department of Defense does a fresh fruit and vegetable program. And so we had $25,000 allocated um, from the uh, Department of Defense. And our government food is also, we do $175,000 worth of food from the government as well. So approximately $200,000. We only pay 9% of that cost, um, which is a great savings to us. Um, We have a new program that we just purchased and we're getting our feet wet right now with it. It's called NutriSlice. And what it'll show is the menu of each different school. We'll have the logos. We're currently downloading everything on. Um, it'll have a different menu exactly to a T what they're serving and what you do is you'll click on those meals and it'll have a picture of the meal it'll have the nutritional breakdown of the meal and it'll have allergy alerts on it as well Mm -hmm. um, so that you can we we get a lot of demand um, uh, from 
you know, people who are on diets, for instance, and or diabetes in the school or uh, all the different uh, various allergies, and it helps now to have them able to see it. Um, so it involves a lot of work to get this whole entire library going, but we're, we're so getting every, close. Everything that we sell, you'll just be able to go on and pick the picture and pop it up and it'll show you all the nutrients for it. It's really cool. And then they say that there's a phone app, but I, I'm a little bit afraid of that right now. So we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll, work we'll get towards that. So. <laughs> All right, child nutrition program guidelines. Um, what are we serving and how are we, ser are we following the guidelines? Well, they're constantly changing, so we have to constantly uh, read the updates uh, for the policies and procedures. Uh, we have to consistently do a nutrient analysis and follow the guidelines. Uh, staff development and training is a brand new thing. Everybody must have at least four hours of training every single year, uh, be it with serve safe, um, knife handling skills, something along that lines. It has to fall into specific categories. Um, and then, you know, sensitivity to free and reduce kids, et cetera. There's a lot of different topics that we, we cover throughout the year. Uh, Patty has an enormous grid of, you know, keeping track of everybody's uh, hours. Um, so we do staff development. Um, for that, uh, we have the community eligibility program at Hedge Elementary, which means every single person there eats for free, breakfast and lunch, and we're very, very close to uh, getting uh, Cold Spring um, qualified as well. Uh, we just have to work the math properly to make sure it's uh, uh, beneficial for everyone. Um, free and reduced lunch applications can be and I always like to tell everyone this too because everyone thinks that it only happens in the fall or in the late summer. You can fill out an application anytime. Um, we'll even help you through it. Uh, it's a lot of people get, have a hard time with it. Um, so if you experience any hardship throughout the year, one of the um, examples of this was the government shutdown. Um, all of a sudden they had zero income coming into the household so we filled out an awful lot of applications and you can um, administratively approve uh, the different families too until they can get back on their feet. Um, our financials we're responsible for and we have to report to the state with a profit and loss accounts receivable and payable. Uh, student lunch prices and adult lunch prices have to be uh, along the same lines of everybody else in this community. The state has now made it a lunch equity where everyone has to basically charge within about 25 cents of each other uh, to keep your programs afloat. Um, you can no longer go hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt and just walk up and put your hand out at a school committee meeting and say, can we have some money, please? <laughs> um, revenue for non-program uh, foods we have to keep track of. Labor percentage, insurance, we do pay 100% of our insurance for our um, employees. Uh, we're also responsible now for, uh, this is the hot topic, the bad debt charges and charging policies uh, that will be coming up soon. You'll be seeing us again before the end of the year to talk about that. Uh, student trends. Uh, I like to keep in the base year of when all the uh, healthy initiatives came into play. Uh, in fiscal year 12, uh, we served uh, 4,144 meals a day. And as you see now, we've made a slight comeback to 3,581, but we're still down about 500 meals or so per day, and that adds up to an awful lot of money. Um, and as you see, a la carte sales, uh, the 187,000, and now we're down to 70,000. We'll never see that again. So mm -hmm. that's just the way it is. They, they've they've uh, manufactured more baked flavored chips than you can ever imagine, and <laughs> they're at their limits. So um, breakfast participation has increased about 100 per day, which is great. We're right about, uh, you know, 970, 980 uh, last year, and it was fluctuating all over the place. But now we're doing a solid 1,021 breakfast per day. And we're finding a lot of kids coming in off the bus hungry, and they want to eat. Mm -hmm. It's great, too. On the elementary school level, the kids will take the entire breakfast, for instance, and they'll take the fruit that they have and then that will be their snack for later on in the morning. So it's, uh, it's serving more than one purpose. Um, we're getting a lot of bang for the buck. Uh, expenses, uh, food expenses, you probably noticed uh, just shopping recently, it's gone through the roof. Um, the healthy ingredients cost more money, 1.153 million. 
um, is up about 7% from last year. Um, what's happening a lot is, for instance, we're dealing with a lot of disasters, hurricanes, and things like that, and people don't understand that we could have a drought out in California or a hurricane in the Carolinas, and it directly affects the food that we get or don't get. Um, it gets reallocated somewhere else. Uh, the romaine salmonella outbreak for a month, uh, we were paying $24 a case for lettuce, uh, went up to over $45 per case just like that overnight. Um, and my phone was blowing up because you get people sending these reports to you and I have to figure out the best cost and the, the best place to buy them. Um, labor, uh, 1.2 million. I think I've been saying the words one part or the numbers 1.1 for a long, long time and now we're officially bro broached the uh, 1.2 million. Uh, fixed cost health insurance, uh, fiscal year 16, it was 342,000. We're at 352,803 now, which means we need to sell 117,601 meals at $3 a piece just to pay for the health insurance alone. That's about two and a half months worth of meals. And that's with zero food costs, zero labor costs, just sheerly paying for the insurance. More expenses. I just want to flip a page and have great news here. Uh, other expenses are about $160,000, fuel, meals tax, uniforms, vehicle repairs, software, Nutrislice license renewals, equipment repairs, and equipment replacement. It's about $50,000 a year. We do all our own um, uh, equipment uh, repairs and replacement. Uh, we fix the vans, um, everything. Office supplies, printing costs, charging, and student debt. And that is it. Any questions for us? Committee members, Ms. Burgess. When you go back to um, insurance for all employees, because it sounds like when you say 100%, but that's not really what's in their contract. So can you? It's the, the breakout. They, we pay, they pay the, I believe it's 25%. 25. They pay 25, we pay 100%. And then, and then we pay the remaining 75%. That was all on health costs that you had on? Yeah, the comes out of our budget. Yeah, yeah. okay. All right. We have 25 I just didn't want to be misinterpreted. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> Other questions? Ms. Berger. Ms. Berger. I'm just wondering, back in the slide where you're like the FY12 and how you're getting close to, well, 500 shy. Right. Do you see a, like the same increase per year? So, you, you know, like maybe in five years you'll get down there because the student's palate is, the kids are you know, a lot used to now. what they're, yeah. yeah. At when it first happened, I'm like, yeah. I'm going to this. Oh, no. yeah. This yeah. is not going to make yeah. it. Yeah. And kids like wheat bread now. Yes. Before, they would not even look at wheat bread. They're like, wow, I'm not eating that. It has to be on white bread. Yeah. Um, cereal or chips, we never sold baked chips. Yeah. Um, no. Now they love baked chips. No. You know, so there's a lot of things where I would have thought, mm, they're not going to buy that. They yeah. really come around. Yeah, the, the downward spiral has stopped, and we are starting to climb, which is great. And it is mainly, it's mainly because the kids are getting used to it. Palette. They just are. Yeah, it's it's amazing to me. Cookies, it's cool, yeah. you know? <laughs> and it's the ice cream, you know? Right, right. I think people in general are eating healthier. So yeah, it's kind are. of a reflection, like at home you eat healthier, you're more conscious of what you're eating, and it reflects on our kids. It goes back to them. I want to ask a question about something you said about uh, consistency with other school districts. Uh, this something feels unfair in that in that uh, uh, edict, because you know you are completely self-sustained and there, you are not in our budget at all. Um, but there could be a district nearby. Um, well, I don't know this. I, I could be quite ignorant too. There could be a district nearby whose uh, lunch program is subsidized by the taxpayers, and therefore they could have a lower price and bring down the average for the group. Uh, I don't, you know, this, this is very much in my look like regional school bus reimbursement. We're bigger than most regional school districts, but we can't get the reimbursement. This concerns me in the same way. You hit it the happens. nail right on the it's head. <laughs> that is, it is, um, when I go to meetings, uh, nobody wants to see my profit loss because there's that, the big, huge, you know, uh, the insurance cost is a, a something in there that nobody else has incurred at all. 
everybody looks at us and says, I have no idea how you're all still in business. But we've been creative. We've gone to Council of Aging. We've picked that up. We've picked up a lot of other Yeah, it's very clear. Catering ...to help bring money into our program to right. help offset the cost of the insurance. Yeah, it's very clear that you guys are doing your work in order to maintain your fiscal autonomy from the taxpayer. But um, there should be, there should be some, some uh, uh, bennies for having been able to do that. Mm. Uh, and perhaps if this is an unfair edict from the, uh, the State Department, we ought to write a letter. Because we should not be in that group. I, we, as I see it's, it. it's funny to, to go to, for instance, a PCD meeting and, um, and truly understand the words unfunded mandates. Um, you think it just happens in the educational world. It's happening in the food service world as well, um, where you get these things just passed down. And for instance, uh, they were relaxing the um, you, the sodium content, et cetera, and the, and, the, and the you could have white pasta once a week and things like that. Well, Massachusetts loves to to be the healthiest state that they possibly can, and they're not going to relax. It doesn't matter what Washington says; they're going to you know keep those. And, and I don't think that that's going to help, anyways. I think we're we're going down the right road with this, but. Um, at a point, you know, we're, we're doing okay now. It sounds like all doom and gloom, but uh, because of the different things that we are doing, uh, for instance, you know, rising tide, you, you, you send off, you, all of a sudden you get the, the bill that we sent off and then the check comes in, you're like, wow, that was certainly a surprise. And that was <laughs> something that they're, they're our neighbors and at least we're getting something, you know, out of the, the whole entire deal and so are they. Uh, service and and, it, and it's funny to th have to think like that, like the restaurant world type of deal, or real caterers, you know, from this right. standpoint. Dr. Maestas, one of the things that we were struggling with when the transition um, was presented to um, school lunch programs across the Commonwealth, across the country, was exactly what the data demonstrates: is that the significant drop off initially, and we were really. Uh, grappling with the fact that the school department through the budget would maybe have to assume some of those costs for health care and things of that nature and I think it's a significant credit to Patrick and Patty that they really uh, one try to make sense of the different food types for kids for students and the second thing is looking at creative ways of uh, generating re revenue which we didn't do before so I think um, other school lunch programs uh, are subsidized significantly by budget and we're one of the only self-sustaining <coughs> and I mean completely self-sustaining programs uh, within uh, the Commonwealth and I think it has a lot to do with management and I think it has to do a lot with trying to create some level of um, appealing food for, for children because they, they just won't eat some of the foods <coughs> that we I mean we did a school committee a meeting uh, about seven, eight years ago, where we actually had the school committee eat the food that the kids were getting, which is yeah. whole wheat pasta. And back then, whole wheat pasta, I mean, it's gotten a lot better, even the product itself. Better, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, some of us have a palate for that kind of stuff, but the kids just don't. Mm -hmm. But I think over time they have. And, and salads, it's amazing to see the amount of, you talk about buying cases of, of lettuce. We, we, I mean, it's amazing how much. So yeah, it's, I think that's a good, a good ship, but to your point, Dr. Sorensen, there are a lot of things that the general community doesn't realize that we have to grapple with. And um, we've had to make some tough decisions. Um, there's a breaking point with a $3 lunch. I mean, if we went to 325 350 for a lunch, you know, there's, right. I think we're really conscientious about not trying to increase that. And matter of fact, going to $3 was somewhat uh, it was huge. a big deal for us because we, we just weren't in that space. But I think um, it also puts another limit to school lunch programs that are not in the black when you have the, the limits on what you can charge for, for school lunch. And I think that's where, you know, when Patrick brings these issues up, I think it's, uh, it's going to be an, an ongoing challenge for school departments to run food service and make it um, where you're in the black. It just, it's just not working. Any other questions, Ms. Badger? I have 
I, it's funny, I had the same thought, and then Miss Hunt just sent me a text message, and she's wondering if you guys have been in discussions with MAP Academy at all, or if that's something that we might be able to help out. I know initially in the discussions we had, when they were organizing MAP Academy, it was that potentially they would, you know, use our food services and some of our other services, and so she's curious as to what's, ha if that's happening. Um, we always, those are like the pockets of kids for sure that, you know, we would love to um, deal with, and it certainly is another revenue outlet. Um, and uh, we, we attempted to uh, piece together uh, a, a deal this past, uh, it was late August, it was getting right up to the edge of the school year uh, where the anxiety and your hair is just standing up and everything uh, so we had to abandon it and they also they had a uh, an alternate plan with a with a food service company and wanted to make sure that they did um, but we uh, decided to uh, just separate uh, at least for this year so but uh, yes it was explored I'm all I'm always poking around yeah. <laughs> <For sure. laughs> any, any other questions uh, before I say thank you for coming in I want to tell you that uh, I don't have a lot of interaction with your cafeteria workers, but sometimes I'm in the buildings around lunchtime, and they are the most pleasant people you could ever imagine, and they, and the kids just smile. So it's just a wonderful <laughs> thing to have. It's a great asset. I, I always tell them, thank you very much for saying that. Um, that uh, with the time on learning and everything, and you, you've got to think of the rigor of the day itself. Uh, you know, lunch should be happy. Right. right. <laughs> Plain right. itself. Yeah. Okay. Right, thank you very much. Thanks thank for coming. Thank you. My no, guest. No, it's my guest. guest. Yeah, Tim. We'll go with me. Uh, okay. <laughs> Is there anything on to, to bring up under old business this evening? Miss Badger. I think I'm going to like be a broken record, but so I know um, a few months ago we were talking about health and brought up health last time. And I know there was potential that we were going to get an update on how that process is going as we're looking at the health mm -hmm. curriculum and making changes and things. And tonight I was at the Plymouth South Middle School School Council and I think just having some side conversations with some of the parents and they were very interested to see what we're doing as a district. And so I didn't know if we were planning some sort of mid-planning review. Actually, actually tonight like in, in the update on Dr. Maesa's goals, we'll be talking about health. Okay, good, because I didn't see that and because I it didn't get posted when I was able to view it. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, that'll be up coming up in a few moments. Anything else under old business? Okay. Under new business, anything new to bring up this evening? All right. Seeing no hands on that one, we shall move along to the superintendent's report. Dr. Maestas. Yes. Good evening, everyone. I have a few items to uh, present this evening, and I do have a guest for us tonight that I want to bring up in a little bit. Um, I notified the school committee last Friday afternoon after school that we had a um, sprinkler that let go at Plymouth South High School in the fire suppression system, and it was in the um, Allied Health uh, classroom. And it appears that that uh, sprinkler was uh, defective. We had an investigation today to review that, and uh, it looks like there was no um, uh, weather-related issues that would cause that to uh, let go. Uh, the weather was, um, was, was mild uh, when, it, when it let go, and we had our staff look at it on Friday, um, and the uh, inspectors came in today. The um, d different organizations came and looked at it today. Uh, Arthur Montra and his staff looked at it, and it appeared to be um, that there is a uh, was a defective sprinkler head uh, that let go. So I'd just like to highlight the second shift custodians uh, that were in the building and they worked very quickly to minimize damage. <coughs> uh, we, we are uh, working with the insurance company to, to repair some of the, the, the water issues that are present, but it was one classroom that was impacted and a, a little bit of water got into one of the neighboring classrooms. So. That will be done, um, that restoration will take place, but it's minimal, and I think it's really due to the custodians that were available uh, and on the site during that period of time, during that period of, uh, of, of the day, time of day. So uh, we're very fortunate for that. Um, also, I want to remind the school committee that the uh, gala is this weekend at uh, Waverly Oaks. If you would like to go, please let me know. 
And the last thing I have to report on is I have a guest, um, guest with me tonight, and I'd like to see if they wouldn't mind coming up to the table. So I had the opportunity to uh, meet this young man who is a student at Indian Brook Elementary, and his name is Aiden. So Aiden, come on up. And his father is also a teacher at Indian Brook Elementary. And his mom, they all came to my office one afternoon, and I set up an appointment to meet with, with, with them. And um, he is a fantastic young man. He was actually given a citation by uh, Governor Baker. And he's in kindergarten at, uh, at Indian Brook. And um, his name is Aiden. And he ha was born with a heart defect. And he has been um, a champion of um, heart health. And his parents have, have really uh, worked with Aiden to realize that he has a, a special heart. And they came to visit with me and probably about a month ago or so. And we collaboratively came up with this thought that for um, Valentine's week, we would celebrate heart health. Mm -hmm. And we're going to do it because we have a spokesperson at Indian Brook Elementary by the name of Aiden, who is going to help us lead that charge. So the week of uh, heart health week for the district, we have a little video that he went into the studio last week and he did a little video and we're going to kick that off during that week and um, his parents are here so I'm not sure if you want to say a few words but he's my new friend and um, we are, we are we're, we're, we're getting closer by the week so. Um, Hello Aiden. Aiden, hi. Say hi. Hey, Aiden, Aiden, look at yourself on television. Look, Aiden, oh boy, Aiden, Aiden, we're on TV. Aiden, look at the TV. <laughs> <laughs> Aiden, how old are you? Six years old? And what grade are you in? Kindergarten. Very good. Do you love it? Yeah. He Tell wants. me something about kid and God you really love. What do you love? <laughs> I'm not sure I like that answer. Yeah, yeah. Especially as a teacher at the school. Um, it, as Dr. Maest has pointed out, um, Aiden was born uh, with a congenital heart defect. Uh, he had been born about 2.30 in the afternoon. It wasn't just a couple hours afterwards that uh, I was told that um, they detected a heart murmur and that um, they had moved him to the neonatal ICU. And it wasn't too much longer. I, um, I had gone down to see him a few times, but uh, around midnight that night, uh, the doctor came to tell us that they, they couldn't wait any longer. They were going to wait for a specialist to come in from Boston Children's the following morning. And they rushed him up to uh, Boston Children's Hospital. And uh, the day after he was born, he had a, a five-hour procedure, um, cardiac catheterization. Try saying that ten times fast. Uh, they take a catheter that went in through his leg and um, they had a deflated balloon on the tip. And um, his condition is known as um, um, pulmonary valve stenosis. So the, the pulmonary valve is narrowed, so they put that catheter with the deflated balloon into the valve and they inflate it to try to widen, widen the valve. And um, thankfully it was successful. And one of the funny things is uh, he was in the hospital for about maybe, what, maybe 10 days after that. And he was lying in bed one day sleeping. And I said to my sister, he's smiling. Mm -hmm. And she's like, ah, oh, that's just gas. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I really do think it was a true smile because he hasn't stopped since. And everybody at school comments that, you know, he's such a happy kid. He comes to school with a smile. Uh, he's really affected a, a lot of people's lives because everybody he's met, he's made an impression on them. And um, he was so excited to meet Dr. Maestas that day. And uh, 
we were leaving and I kept saying, you know, this is a big thing, Aiden. I mean, <laughs> Dr. Maestas is in charge of the whole district. And he says, yeah, now he's my friend. <laughs> so I pointed out to him that maybe the next time Dr. Maestas comes to the school to visit, I don't think he's going to have a problem picking Aiden out of the Not crowd because he's going <laughs> to want to run over and say hi to him. But um, we really appreciate you know, being able to come here and, and introduce our son to you. And we're really excited that um, congenital heart defects uh, are recognized. And my wife, who was kind of the impetus about moving this forward, you know, she wasn't looking for donations. She wasn't looking for people to bring things. She didn't want to, like, step on anybody's toes. And she just wanted it to be recognized. And um, there's a lot of people uh, that I met in that hospital. And um, I, I, learned, I learned a lot about um, his condition and uh, what it entailed. But uh, as we move forward, you wouldn't know it to see him. He's very active. He runs. He jumps. He plays all kinds of sports. And um, we're just lucky to have him. And I can't thank uh, the doctors at Boston Children's Hospital enough because um, they really know their business over there. They've been great. He goes there once a year to get a checkup. And other than that, um, he's been doing fine. We're Dr. Very happy. back to you. Well, I... Um I thought it was a, a good idea to refocus our efforts on heart health post to giving, giving flowers and that kind of thing, and just maybe people can focus on helping um, and being aware of how important it is to have a great heart and, and, be in, and keep that heart in great shape, because I think sometimes we take it for granted that we just live every day and don't really understand how important it is to have a healthy heart. And Aiden is our spokesperson for the year around heart health and we're just really excited and it really ties in a lot with and we talked about the opening day presentation when they came in uh, and the whole concept of this is me well this is Aiden and this is what Aiden brings to the plate and we're just honored to be able to have him uh, with us and have you as parents to to want us to partner and do something really good for everybody in this community so well, we're very appreciative yes. of all the help and all the time that you've, you've allowed, uh, you know, given us and talking to us. And, you know, he's, he's been very excited. He's, he <laughs> saw you walk in tonight and made his night. Because been, I don't think he's seen you since the day we came into the office. Committee members, we have any questions? Ms. Um, when you talk about how um, Aiden has made an impression, I do remember Aiden <laughs> because we met at PFN. Yes, yes. So my son used to play with him. Oh, so, I <laughs> and I remember the story. I still have your number. Yes. <laughs> I don't use it. <laughs> yes, yeah. So, um, yes, and I do remember the story. Uh, he was young. I think my son was like two or three years old when we first um, met your family. So, yes. Any, any other questions or comments? Oh, I, I, I just want to point out something that happened three minutes ago. You folks couldn't see it because you couldn't see his face. But when his dad said that Dr. Maestas was his new friend, he looked over at Dr. Maestas and the look in his face was pure, <laughs> pure love. I mean, it was wonderful. It only lasted a half a second, but it was there. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming in. Thanks for having us. We appreciate it. Mr. Loria, thank you. Kid. Dr. May, is there anything else on your report this evening? That is, uh, that is all. Thank you. Any committee members for questions, or uh, of Dr. Maestas and his report? Okay. Should we take a break? Correspondence this evening, Mr. Morgan. Um, there's no correspondence this evening. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> the superintendent's mid-cycle update, Dr. Maestas. Yes. So typically, um, through the goal process or goal review process, I provide a mid-cycle report. And tonight, I'm going to walk through my goals and kind of give you an idea of where we are. Um, the first goal that I 
um, stated this year was relative to school improvement plans and the process for school improvement plans. And I think you all realize that um, by sitting at this table that we have revamped that process and uh, a lot of work has gone into it. Dr. Campbell has been working with principals on presentation and, on, and also the, the, the format, the content consistency of it. And our goal is really centered around um, uh, accountability. And that's one of the things that we discussed last year uh, is what we wanted to, to see levels of, of, of academic account accountability and measures that we would insert into the school improvement plans. And I think that is relative to what we discussed uh, last school year and also the desire for us to have a more uniform uh, template to give principles so that there would be more consistency in the presentation. So that is, uh, is was working through, um, uh, through the process. And I think you'll also realize that some of our schools are in the process of uh, finishing off their school improvement plans and others will be developing new ones. So over the next two years, uh, you'll start to see most of the schools transition in and out of the old plan uh, and model into the new plan. So that's something that we're going to continue to monitor and uh, be able to um, shape that a little bit more as we go forward. Committee members with questions or comments about this update on goal number one? Uh, it has been already observed at the committee table. Mm -hmm. I think Ms. Hunt did it once, and I think Ms. Badger did it once, mm -hmm. commenting to presenters that the, uh, the uh, Form. measurements have been incorporated and explained to us and that, that's been very helpful and I think it's something that uh, is helping the uh, principals to hone in and have data discussions with staff and really set those school-wide goals and it really does help inform the process when uh, principals have sit down goal meetings with their staff how does it relate to your work in the classroom so there's a consistency between what's happening in the classroom, what's happening at uh, the principal's observation level, and also how does it tie in with uh, the school improvement plan. So I think there's, there's that triangulation that can take place. All right, goal number two. <clears throat> the next goal was relative to the theme for the school year, and I think um, you heard our student uh, representative, Ms. Pike, present today relative to the Butterfly Project. And I actually, this is not planned, but I put a picture in in, in the uh, report that I was in the building last week and I saw uh, this, uh, this painting and it's, it's uh, what the young lady was referring to this evening. And this is um, relative to the theme and it was inspired by the theme for the year and it was interpreted by an art teacher, one of, the, one of, one of our art teachers and um, is really um, about us creating opportunities for students so that so they can spread their wings and realize their dreams in life. So uh, we want them to come into school, you know, realize uh, what's, what we have to offer, what they can partake in, and then allow them to, to go out and, and be what they really want in, in life. So uh, there are many examples of um, uh, these type of activities in all our schools in the district. And one of the things that I was talking to my staff this morning about is that I am going to offer a survey to all our students in the district to see uh, how the theme for this year has really impacted them at a personal level and what it means to them. And sh I'll share that with you um, at, the, at the end of the, of the process. So you can kind of get a sense of how kids are um, gravitating to really looking at embracing who they are and really uh, identifying things that can help enha enhance who they are. And uh, I think that's something that um, will really help to get a good sense as, as to how uh, widespread um, these themes are across the district and, and hopefully uh, we'll see some, um, I think we'll see a, a great deal of, um, of uh, awareness across the district. Are there any members with questions or comments on this goal? No, I was just wondering. Ms. Ms. I was wondering Burgess. if um, you're talking about the This Is Me theme? Yes. Yeah. And um, so, if, if that gets across and there's an awareness among the kids, will that help, do you think, with bullying? As, I, pe as the bullies actually get more aware of themselves yeah. and happy, then will, will there be less of it as well? Well, and that's one of the things that I really wanted the underlying message to all of this is how we can all be accepting of one another. Yeah. And I, I believe that a lot of the 
uh, opportunities that teachers and buildings are uh, working on have, have, have made some level of, uh, of impact as far as awareness. And, and that's what we want our kids to feel comfortable being in any building, any space, any classroom, any situation, so that they, if they don't feel good about themselves that one day, for whatever reason, that people can realize that everyone can have a bad day mm -hmm. and they can, um, you know, we can help them through those days opposed to being so um, persuasive with our words. And um, that's the hope, Marge. That's the hope. To, to uh, follow up something you said a minute ago, uh, about measuring how uh, this, uh, this theme of, of acceptance is impacting our students in a positive way. Uh, one of the measures, I'm, I'm guessing, would be non-traditional students in the vocational programs. How has that number changed over the years? You know, I can tell you that some of our um, students in uh, plumbing and electrical um, are non-traditional students from what we saw 20 years ago. And uh, I think it's fantastic to see that cross-section of student that we didn't see. Um, I think it's changed in a sense that um, kids will take what they want to be part of. And there's, I think our hope and our goal is to minimize that stigma of uh, some programs being for specific genders. Right. And I think that's what we would like to see is if they, if they have an idea that they want to pursue that as, right. a, as a career. So my question is, are we seeing that? I think we are. Yeah, and I, I, I think we have, Dr. Sorensen, in the last 10, 12 years. Well, well we see it here and there. I'm looking yeah. to see if there's a trend. Sure. I think um, I'd have to look at the numbers on the trends again. When I was at South, we did see an increase. Um, and I'm sure it's gone up. We, I know that there's some an intentional programming that is done with, they bring in speakers in non-traditional fields um, to speak to the kids, with, as freshmen especially. So I can get some more information on that from the building. But I believe it's gone up. Um, mm -hmm. We've had some real student leaders who are not, we call them non-trons, in their shops. I know a young lady in plumbing last year was a major leader in the state in vocational education. So we've even seen some leadership, which never happened before mm -hmm. in the, if they were in the non-traditional field. Right, so right. Wow, that's pretty intense. Yeah, it was pretty, yeah. she's an unbelievable girl. And, um, and I think the teachers have really embraced it, if that makes sense, over the years. They really, they, they understand and, and want it. So um, especially in the, the more, the physical trades, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And, and Jim, I think another, uh, Dr. Sorensen, another thing that I've noticed is even in robotics, where we have uh, a variety of, of um, girls that have participated at a significant level that we didn't see them um, really gravitating to the sciences. And I think we see that shift. It's not only in vocational, but uh, very, very, uh, we did a video about two years ago, uh, and uh, it's pretty uh, awesome to see that there's a variety of students that take part in, in these programs. So um, it probably would have been a, a great thing for us to do years ago to see, uh, we probably can do it, is to see what that cross-section is mm -hmm. over time to see how that change is, is taking yeah, place. I think it's a good, that's a good, yeah. a good measure. Anything else from committee members on this goal? Okay, moving on. Yeah, the next one is relative to the comments that Ms. Badger made earlier, and this is to the health program. That, the health program is, um, is really um, focused on uh, looking at the K through five model that we really are minimal, um, minimal uh, coverage in our district right now. Uh, right now we are uh, assessing all aspects of that program. Uh, we, have, we are working with uh, Mary Connolly. Uh, Mary Connolly is a former health educator here in Plymouth. She used to actually be the um, coordinator for health uh, K through 12 when I first started here in Plymouth and it's hard to believe that 20 years ago we had a full-time health coordinator just like we do for math, science, English, social studies and visual and performing arts <laughs> and, <laughs> and that and that that has gone away and it, it was it was and I think our program began to degradate at the elementary level since then and you know it's unfortunate <coughs> that it, this is one of those programs that has really fallen to the uh, responsibility of the classroom teacher. Now keep in mind that our health program uh, in the future will be multifaceted, where there will be certain pieces that are covered in the classroom. Some will be cut by consultants, but we'll have our um, health teachers come into the classrooms. But I said health teachers. Right now we have one. 
So what our goal is is to take our work and the assessment that's happening right now with health education at the elementary level, and figure out uh, that scope and sequence of what happens from K to 5, uh, the cyclical, cyclical nature of when students have cell health over the years, and actually who is responsible for that coverage of health, and what specific topics um, people have specialties in and they offer uh, across the elementary. So that work is going on now. Um, we do have some curriculum information uh, and curriculum documentation that Dr. Campbell has uh, introduced into the health um, uh, of, uh, excuse me, into the elementary uh, schools, which is health related. Um, when we get to the um, tail end of this school year and I present on the final conclusion of my goals, we'll have uh, some detailed information on how we'll roll, roll that out for next year. One of the things that I want to let the school committee know is when we did our budget development process, you notice that we didn't have additional FTE staff for elementary health. Our goal this year is we do a staffing audit every year and uh, any FTE uh, shifts that we have in the district, if we can reduce a staff uh, person in one area or another, that FTE will go towards elementary health. Uh, we're looking to make those shifts so that beginning of next school year, we can actually have elementary health educators that would be part of our health model. So we won't reduce our FTE count across the district. We will shift staff from where we see uh, lack of enrollment, we see programs that can be reduced, we can take that FTE, and the priority for moving forward is elementary health. So that's what we're going to do so it doesn't impact the budget. And we don't see an increased uh, FTE count as we move forward. So it's exciting to see that uh, we will also have dedicated time at the elementaries for health at a greater level than we have now. So not only will we see staff, they'll have increased time. And we'll also have a delineated model of who teaches what and what cycle. So that's the model moving forward. And we're working on the details now. Um, uh, Assistant Superintendent Fry has been working diligently to predict and to identify potential uh, staff adjustments that we can use to actually um, populate these roles when uh, we're ready to do that. But we anticipate being able to roll out a new model for the beginning of next school year, which is something that I know uh, everyone around this table has been expecting this and excited to be able to, to make this work for us moving forward. Badger, back to you. I just have a quick question. So maybe just clarification. So you sure. said you're, so you're working with Mary Connolly, right? Yes. And she is helping you evaluate what our current staff has to give? Yes. Or, okay. And then we're looking at the holes that we need, and that's how you'll move forward when you fill those full-time FDEs. So M Mary is, is, yeah. is very well-versed in um, a, a variety of uh, K through 12 um, yes. health options. Um, she's a professor, she's written many books on the topic, uh, but her work is really uh, uh, digesting and taking apart exactly what we do and actually reassembling it so that there's a, a model that we can have some level of sustainability. In addition, she, uh, we're going to work with her to provide professional development to the staff that we do bring in for a consistency so that they can stick with our model, um, but uh, I feel very strong uh, commitment to um, the work that we're doing in this area and, and I feel comfortable that Mary will add a great level of benefit to the district as we move forward uh, with uh, this K through 5 model and I think what we'll do is we'll continue to assess how things you know then evolve into the middle school and into the high school of course we have a model at the middle school and high school our biggest void right now is the elementary okay. and is there like um, I never mind. I, it left me. It left my Taylor. brain. Come back to me. Uh, <laughs> when will the state be done um, uh, uh, re um, doing the uh, the, the frameworks or? Yeah, a um, little slow. Okay. And um, there's a draft out for review and comment, and uh, we'll see how that shapes up. But again, uh, the consultant that we're working with, Mary who is, uh, just loves working in Plymouth, will help guide that process to ensure that we have alignment between okay. what the state is recommending and what we offer in Plymouth. Okay. And, so and we'll do that across K to 12. And I think that's important to mention is that we 
really want to have a comprehensive model yes. that really embeds as many uh, interdisciplinary features as possible because health can be taught in a lot of different areas. And one of the things that Mary has really uh, articulated very clearly to us is that um, we in education do a great deal to support health in a lot of different aspects mm -hmm. and we don't even know that we're doing it. And there's a, a great deal of interdisciplinary coverage. It's just how do we document, do, document it and how do we um, do a good job at it? I and I think that's one of the things that we're also doing at this point. Brad, back to you. Sorry. I thought of my question. So where we have, and I know we don't have district coordinators for everything, we don't have them for lingu language arts, or not language arts, I mean uh, world languages sure. and things like sure. that. But will it fall under Chris to manage each of yep. these individuals so that we make sure that we're okay? Yep, they, they will fall under um, uh, Dr. Campbell's Campbell, uh, review and, and realm. And, you know, uh, right now there's support at the building level for the individuals. And I think the elementary principals are invested in, in supporting that uh, as, as well. And uh, uh, Ms. Fry has yeah. a comment as well. <laughs> I think um, one piece that's missing as well as the, the staffing right now, especially K to three, is the partnership. So I think one thing, and they speak for the elementary principals, we'd like to partner together would be the elementary PE, the elementary health, um, look to a mentor as well for a link to the middle school and have, we have an elementary um, PE teacher who travels as well. Um, so I think that group is really yearning for more interaction. So I think we're looking to formalize that through our, our PD options and things like that as well, make it kind of a unit as well so um, with the staffing end of it anything else on this goal okay now the pilgrim academy goal I'll say one yeah, we'll um, was another question I'm just sorry. just one more question will um, will the school nurses have any type of role in terms of health education or I think this is an all-in all hands on deck okay. opportunity for us to see whether it's alignment okay of who can cover what based on expertise, based on subject, based on okay. a, a variety of training features that they may have that we would rely on them for. Okay. And I think it's the key right now, the um, elementary health educator is kind of standalone, is on an island. So I think through the staffing and then things grow, whereas the, I know six to 12, the nurses are very integral. It's very symbiotic with the health teachers and the phys ed teachers. So there's a lot of communication mm -hmm. um, at the high schools, the phys ed teachers, many of them teach both sections because they're certifications or they can teach one section out of their certification so there's more unity so I think the making it more of a quote-unquote department will really help with the growth and ideas and things like that so and um, Dana Powers at PCIS has been very vocal and helpful with us with the the model as well has been okay. a real liaison too so. okay. okay final goal well, one of the things that I believe has been a success so far in the school year. We're halfway through the school year, and I don't. I, I, I think this summer around uh, July, we were really a little concerned about what was going to happen with the alternative school program. And to see where we are today, and to see where the students uh, are located, and, and all the program features, I think it's uh, really turned out to be a fantastic win for the students that we have. I think they feel that they're embedded in a in a. Uh, in a, in a home, um, there's there's a, a great deal of input that um, uh, the director has had from from our our office, and um, I would absolutely love an opportunity during the school day to get the school committee into Plymouth Harbor Academy. So what we'll do is I'll see if uh, Ms. Grimes can set up a couple of times if your schedule can allow to take a walk through Plymouth Harbor Academy when students are in session. They, don't, they do not mind uh, talking with you. They're, um, they are, I run into students from Plymouth Harbor Academy probably three or four times a week. I go down and visit with them quite often. Um, but I think you'll be pleasantly surprised as, at the, um, the venue, the space, and the amount of work that it's taken to get that building, uh, that lower level in shape. And, become a school down there. It's actually performs like a, a school and they're very happy. Um, but it's taken a lot of, of work from a lot of people to actually get that done in the crunch time that we had to do it. I think today is a, I think if, um, you know, given that they've had um, a half, half school year to 
um, prepare themselves for, uh, for visitors, I think it would be a great time to come down and visit. So, uh, Ms. Grams, if we could, let's try to set up a couple of times and, and I'll meet you there. And while you're there, you can walk up into the, the 11 Lincoln Street and see um, some construction by our vocational students. And uh, the first floor is, is, is occupied by uh, special education, uh, human resources, and the business office. You can see those offices in play. So I think we've um, made a, uh, um, a, a situation that was unsure to a situation that has become very positive. Yeah, I think it's great. Yeah. 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 Any, any questions on this goal? Ms. Badgett. Well, I don't have a question on the goal, but I do have just a, so if we could do, and I mean, it happens all the time because we have so much stuff happening in, in schools, but if we can get this stuff posted at least by like seven or eight on a Sunday night, yeah. um, because when I go to work on Friday and Monday mornings and then I have Plymouth South Middle School Council at five, I don't have a chance to review these things. So even if it's a draft and just yeah. something I can look at. Technically. <laughs> Technically, I don't know. I don't think that we've had too many times where any where, where things were not posted in a timely manner. It was a, a, an anomaly this this weekend. We've had a handful, uh, but I was yeah. under the impression that it was posted, but it wasn't posted. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I oh, okay. Yeah. So I there's yeah. Oh. So it's not okay. It's it's, it's a matter of uh, following our internal process. process because uh, I will not bring anything to this table. That's the hard copy. I figured I just I don't like that <laughs> and it's it's a glitch. Thank so, you. Yeah. Okay, great. Great point, great comment. Okay, uh, okay, we're finished with that part of the agenda. Moving on to reports and proposals from committee members. M Mr. Morgan. <clears throat> uh, we were talking earlier about PFN and I went to the early childhood Thank fair you. on Saturday and uh, uh, I've gone three years in a row and it's, it was well attended and uh, a lot of people asking questions, kids running around, different people with um, stations set up so it was great to uh, pay a quick visit and, uh, and lend some support so it was well done. And then <laughs> Michelle, Michelle Kim and I were judges for the first uh, national history. I saw you there, yes. That was fun, though, and I, I enjoyed the um, the process of that, and following through and um, <clears throat> with your team, actually uh, giving feedback to each of the students, even those th who didn't win, mm -hmm. and uh, positive, positive, and and some helpful hints Beautiful. for the future. So uh, I, w I was very pleased thank with that. Thank you, Marge. Yeah. Thank you, and thank you all three of you for judging. <laughs> and uh, Rob Power is the first time we've we've done this. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was hoping we wouldn't have bad weather because, you know, yep. when you have all these things lined up, it was his first one and oh. it worked out really well. No, I thought it was good. I thought it was good. I, I walked around and talked to the kids and they were, they were pretty engaging, <coughs> you know? Yeah. 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 I just wanted to follow up on that. I mean, it, it was really just so cool to see how each of, like, they all chose a different way to express. Mm -hmm. uh, he had documentaries and that was just amazing yeah, to she, see that talent and, um, the passion when you when you ask them questions about it they had a solid like grasp of things I mean we even had a girl who basically told us that her project changed the way she looked at the world mm -hmm. and you know that's the kind of things we want to do and I it was it was awesome so I do think um, that's the definition that's right. of education right yes there. I mean she was she's ready to go do a fundraising project for this for this <laughs> woman in Rwanda and I get her name wrong when I say it but it just just really just amazing and so um, I'm glad we're doing well, it I did posters <laughs> the yep. poster ones and yeah she yeah. did the documents what did Kim do Kim did websites websites see so yeah. we're all different websites nice. and, yeah, no, and then good. papers with the was the fourth <laughs> thank you thank uh, you and then the only other thing I have is that we have a date for the PMC kids ride that I know everybody waits their bated breath every year <laughs> um June 30th 2019 and Dr. Maya says has agreed to come in I will ride ride with us so should be in better shape than I was last year yes <laughs> we all will be won't we <laughs> Yeah. Also on the reports and proposals, I, I had the opportunity one evening a few weeks ago to, to go with Dr. Maestas through Lincoln Street to see mm. the building in its final form. And when you all go there, you're going to be totally amazed. And when you hear the stories yeah. associated, what our vocational students did to that building, 
it, it, it just can almost bring tears to your eyes. It, it's just it, outstanding. It's amazing. And, and the other point to that, I was in that building last week uh, trying to find Mr. Costin to sign something, <laughs> and, they were, and they were putting up the artwork. Isn't it you awesome? know, and that <laughs> is awesome. bringing that yeah, building to life. That's right. To life. Yeah. I get to see it. Yeah. He was right before the artwork. Just mm -hmm. before the artwork. Yeah, right yeah. Before. So, so Dr. Sorensen, I, I um, was in the attic at uh, 253 South Meadow Road last week, just kind of assessing what, how much work we have to do to get out of there. And I found some pictures that I remember seeing when I first came to Plymouth. And I found a picture of the graduating class of 1918. Oh. And the back of that picture is signed, original signatures of every single person in that class. Oh. In addition to the 1918 class, it was a class in 1923. And they're beautifully framed, and I can't wait to put them up. Oh my yes. goodness! That's I just, fantastic. I just wish we could show the other side. Yeah, my mother. Was well, uh, you could. You can figure out a way to do that. Uh, yeah, the the, it's it's absolutely fascinating, and um, yeah, and on top of that, it's taken in front of that building, mm. in front of Lincoln Street. Yes. Oh, that's good. Wow, like fantastic! You can see the front. Uh, yeah. Oh, well, there's no the, door there. No, it's on the side. Because the sides are yeah. where the doors yeah. were. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah, it's very different. Jerry, my mother replace the backing and then frame the back. That's right. Yeah. Right yes. yes. That's what I think I'll do. Yeah. yeah. It's it's very. It's a beautiful thing with big porches, but the problem is autos came in. I think they needed more parking. It's. it's, it's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They didn't seem very happy. Yeah. You know, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that was times. That was times. All right. Times. Moving along to our uh, schedule of bills, Mr. Morgan. Mm, okay. Um, whereas the school committee members have been provided with a copy of the cost center transfer and transaction summary report and more for review, I move that the Plymouth School Committee accept and approve the report and accounts payable warrant S020719 dated February 7th, uh, 2019, in the amount of $300 million. Is that correct? No. $739. Three hundred thousand. Oh, three hundred thousand. Okay, the an extra there's an extra dot there. Oh, yeah, three hundred thousand seven hundred thirty-nine dollars and seventy-nine cents. That's better. <laughs> I see. Yeah, there's extra. There's an extra. It does look yeah, like three hundred million. Two extra. Two extra. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, budget's gone up a little. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, we have it clear now. Is there a second to that motion? Miss Burgess is the second. Is there any question? It's clarified. The amount's clarified. Okay. Um, so we'll take the vote, please. Okay, that's passed by everybody voting this evening. Thank you very much. And uh, committee members, is there any other business to come before the school committee tonight? Seeing no hands, we will stand adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you.